What were you doing when you received the news about receiving the Nobel Prize? You mean at that minute? Yeah. Yes. I was actually on the way out the door to pick up my daughter, who had slept overnight at a friend's place. So, mm -hmm. She had overnight? Yeah, yeah. It was a holiday that day in Germany, so, so it was no school. Mm -hmm. did, you, did you expect it? Were you surprised? No, I was totally surprised. Surprised? Yes. Mm -hmm. I somehow had the feeling that this topic we do doesn't really fit anyway in the price categories, I had mm. the feeling. I wasn't even aware that it was announced that week or anything. Like that. <laughs> really? No. That came really as a surprise yes. then? It's not like you were waiting to see... I was not was waiting by the telephone, no. Oh, wow. <laughs> what do you think is the most uh, useful kind of knowledge out of uh, the Neanderthal gene that you've found, like sequencing them? Mm. Our research is really curiosity driven. We, in a way, sometimes I say we, we are just like archaeologists who make an excavation in a cave to see who lived here and what happened here. We make the excavation in the genome. Mm. So we sort of found out that we are very closely related to Neanderthals. Mm -hmm. We found these distant relatives of Neanderthals, the Denisovans, that in, were in Asia. And that these, both these groups have contributed genetic variants to people today and that those variants still influence things. They influence things like your ability in Tibet to live at high altitudes with a little oxygen in the atmosphere. Is that it, the Denisovan? That's a Denisovan variant. And uh, it influences things like your sense of pain, your risk of miscarriages, or how you deal with infectious diseases, mm -hmm. for example, today. Are we closer to Neanderthals or Denisova? So Neanderthals and Denisovans are sister group. Okay. So, the, so there was a common ancestor of modern humans, Neanderthals and Denisovans, mm -hmm. about half a million years ago or 600,000 years ago. And then about 400,000 years ago, there is a separation of Neanderthals and so. Denisovans. And all these groups mixed with each other when they met. So we have even in, in this cave site, the Nisiva Cave, found a first generation offspring, a girl, whose father was the Nisivan and the mother was Neanderthal. So, I, what was it that the, um, the Nisivan gene is about 0.2% in Asia, mainland Asia, and in Southeast Asia it's 5 well, so the overall contribution to present-day people, it sort of adds up to be about 2% of our genome uh, from everyone outside Africa come from Neanderthals. Okay. And we have different pieces of the Neanderthal yeah. genome. You and I would have different pieces. Mm -hmm. Then from the Nisivans in mainland Asia, it's about 0.2% mm -hmm. or so. And in Aboriginal Australians, Papua New Guinea, it's up to 5% of the Nisivans' yeah. contribution. So yes. Do you have any hypothesis on why there it's a lot higher? I think there's a separate sort of mixture that happened. And one can also see that in, in Papua New Guinea, for example, it's sort of more homogeneous than Nisivan yeah, admixture. Whereas in Japan, for example, there are at least two different the Nisvan groups have contributed. Mm -hmm. One of them is quite close to the genome we sequenced, and the other one is quite distant. Mm -hmm. Are there any other like applications into knowing mm -hmm. the Neanderthal gene? Well, there are a, a number of traits one is aware of right. that are influenced mm -hmm. by genetic variants that come from Neanderthals. Mm -hmm. As you mentioned, if you get infected by the SARS-CoV-2 virus, mm -hmm. your risk of becoming severely ill is effective. The Neanderthal, there is one Neanderthal variant mm -hmm. that makes it more likely that you become severely ill. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't affect how likely you are to get infected, but how sick you get. And there is also another variant on another chromosome that actually makes it less likely to become severely ill. There are also other things, for example, there is a variant of the progesterone receptor. So that's a hormone that's important to prepare the uterus for pregnancies. And that Neanderthal variant for that hormone receptor protects you against early uh, miscarriages. Mm -hmm. So there are a number of, of such mm -hmm. 
variants that still exert their influence today. Do you think that the world really understands, like the public kind of grasps how amazing this is? In general, we are very lucky that the public is very interested in what yeah. we do already since many years. And I do think we do a type of science that is quite easy to explain to yeah. people. I think many people are quite fascinated about the idea that if your roots are in Asia or in Europe, part of your ancestors are actually the Nisuans and, and Neanderthals, mm. and that they have contributed a little bit to people who live today. How do you keep your passion going for so long? <laughs> <laughs> Is it just something that you absolutely love to do? That? Well, on one level, yes. It is sort of curiosity by yourself, but it's also very much a group. You know, you have a team of students and postdocs and technicians that work on this. And I think much of the enthusiasm is generated by the group among the people. Mm. And I'm sort of carried along with that. <laughs> right. mm -hmm. My role is often to work with the first draft of papers yeah. that others have written. Right. And then I think my enthusiasm is very much influenced by how good that first draft <laughs> is. You right, know? Right, right. If it is, requires very much work, I get less enthusiastic when, when I can just sort of steer it a little and discuss the concepts and ideas rather than work on the grammar or right. presentation. Mm -hmm. What will you be doing here at OIST? Yeah. So we are particularly interested in genetic changes that we can now identify on the modern human lineage. Mm. So things that changed in the half million years since we had a common ancestor with ne Neanderthals and Denisovans and spread to almost everyone who lives today. And that's an interesting set of changes because it somehow defines present-day humans as a biological group. Mm. So we are Studying those, for example, by putting such changes into mice and seeing how it influences the metabolism or the behavior or the function of the brain. And we sometimes put them also into cells, so edit human cells back to the ancestral state and try to study the consequences of that. So we're very happy to be in this environment where there are lots of good neurobiologists, mm. for example, around. Mm. Uh, is there anything special about the facility, uh, for example, at OIS, mm. that kind of mm. attracted you to come mm. here? Yes, it's really this, that this is a large group, of really large place with many inter groups that are really, really good, particularly, say, in the area of neurobiology, where we really need input because we are particularly interested in aspects of neurobiology, but we're not neurobiologists ourselves. So in this interactive environment that has been created here is very sort of attractive mm -hmm. to us. And I guess the lack of department will help kind of communicate mm -hmm. better among different researchers. So in Japan, social and peer pressure mm -hmm. is really strong. Mm -hmm. What would you say mm. to that, you know, people who kind of are afraid of not being normal and not going in the path that people usually take, uh, like especially women who... I mean, I would say that in, in general, science is a sort of very anti-authoritarian enterprise. Mm. It's almost helpful if a little bit you want to show mm. that your boss is wrong mm. and that what everyone thinks and what's in a textbook is wrong. Mm. That is sort of a good sort yeah. of, uh, uh, sort of, what should I say, uh, sort of stimulation or sort of thing, uh, trying to show that. Mm. It is problematic if you have a very hierarchical structure where you're afraid of your boss. Mm. If you're afraid to say something that may be stupid, mm -hmm. for example, a good way to perhaps sort of work against that as a boss is to really ask the stupid questions yourself. Right. So you show that, you know, I don't know much more than you about this. And when I don't understand something, I ask. Mm. And that's what we all have to do. Mm. What, what is the number one or kind of like a rule of thumb advice you give mm. to your PhD or graduate students? I mean, in general, if people wonder what they should do, I tend to say you should do what you enjoy and what you find interesting. 
it's generally, you're generally automatically rather good at something you're interested in and enjoy. You tend to not like things that you're bad at. So, and then at least you have a good time while you do it.